Princess Sorel was beyond beautiful. When the King of France, Charles VII, first laid eyes on her in 1444, he was struck dumb by her stunning good looks. With golden hair, large pale blue eyes, and a striking figure, Charles absolutely had to have her. He was already married, of course, to the queen, Marie of Anjou, with whom he had 14 children. But, depressed and melancholy, beat down by the sorry state of his floundering country, most agreed that Agnes was good for Charles. She soon claimed the title of first officially recognized royal mistress. Though often scandalous and scantily clad, Agnes was also incredibly intelligent and kind. With Agnes by his side, Charles VII changed the course of the kingdom, reclaiming territory lost to England and ending the Hundred Years' War with a French victory. Some historians place Agnes in the same realm of influence as Joan of Arc, savior of France. But... Not everyone was a fan. When Agnes Sorel died in 1450 at the age of 28, the official cause of death was dysentery. The symptoms fit well enough anyway. But did you know, forensic testing after her body was exhumed in 2005 actually suggests murder? Let's fix that. Hello, I'm Shay LaFontaine, and you're listening to History Fix, where I discuss lesser-known true stories from history you won't be able to stop thinking about. If you listen to this week's episode about diamonds, you know that Agnes Sorel was gifted what was possibly the first ever cut diamond by France's King Charles VII. As a prominent, though scandalous, woman of the court, she was naturally a trendsetter, an influencer in 15th century France. This diamond Agnes flaunted as the officially recognized mistress of the king is what started the trend of women wearing diamonds. Before that, they were reserved only for men. Just a quick disclaimer, I'm going to butcher all the French. Just, it's going to happen. Just deal with it. Agnes came from somewhat humble beginnings. She was born in 1422 into a family of lesser nobility in Touraine, France. But her otherworldly beauty, fair skin, and pale blue eyes were too great for Touraine. Historian Joseph Delort wrote of her in 1824, saying, quote, The reputation of her striking beauty soon crossed the limits of terrain and drew near it an infinity of magnificent lords. Agnes became lady in waiting to Isabel of Lorraine in northeastern France. This is where King Charles VII, suffering from depression, first laid eyes on her. Let's pause to talk about that depression for a minute. Charles was a melancholy dude. But he had reason to be. His father was King Charles VI. I talked about Charles VI in episode 11 about Mad Kings. Crazy how often these guys pop up in other stories. Charles VI was the one who suffered from glass delusion. He thought his body was made of glass, and he had iron rods sewn into his clothing to keep it from shattering. He also didn't recognize his wife and son, refused to bathe or change his clothes for five months, and he suffered from violent episodes, once killing four of his knights and attacking his brother. But he was totally normal until around age 24. It's believed he suffered from schizophrenia, which explains all the erratic behavior. But who's to say, really? Whatever the cause, he was mentally unwell. So under Charles VI's 42-year reign until his death in 1422, France basically fell apart. It's almost in a state of civil war, Almost two-thirds of French territory is being controlled by England and Burgundy. They're in the midst of the Hundred Years' War fought between England and France over territory and who should rule France, and its finances are a disaster. So this is the throne Charles VII inherited from his crazy father. Needless to say, he's a little depressed. So when he first lays eyes on Agnes Sorel, he's like, 
I must have her. Now, Charles himself is not much of a looker. According to Eleanor Herman in a Crime Reads article titled Poisoning Agnes Sorel, quote, King Charles was not a man to inspire the tender fancies of lovely girls. And indeed, his only attractive feature was his crown. Small and slight, he wore heavily padded tunics to hide his sunken chest and narrow shoulders, and in an age where crotch-high tunics were the height of fashion, he wisely wore long robes to conceal his knock knees. His portrait by Jean Fouquet portrays him as a sad circus clown whose pinhead rises above a flood of grotesquely padded red velvet. Considering that royal portraits were almost universally flattering, we can only imagine what the poor man really looked like. End quote. <laughs> His personality did not make up for it either. According to Herman, quote, Sometimes Charles sank under the weight of his heredity, mutating into a morbid sloth, unwilling to lift a finger against English invaders. At times, his nerves were so frayed, he couldn't bear anyone to look at him. Mistrustful and terrified, he lived in constant fear of assassination. End quote. But Agnes was not phased by the knock knees or the slothiness, apparently. He's the king of France. She's like, okay. Let's do it. It was actually Charles' mother-in-law, Yolande of Aragon, who brought Agnes to his court to be his mistress. Yes, his mother-in-law, as in the mother of his wife. But even his wife, Maria of Anjou, seemed fine with Agnes sleeping with her husband and became godmother to three of their surviving children. Pretty nuts, but I think these women just could not deny the positive effect Agnes had on Charles. With Agnes by his side, Charles transformed from a meek, terrified, depressed sloth into a confident, strong, and decisive ruler. Agnes persuaded him to appoint competent advisors to deal with the war and the ruinous state of the country. And in just two years, France was almost completely reconquered. And because of this, some historians claim Agnes Sorel was just as influential as Joan of Arc in helping to save France during this time. Because this is all the same time period. Joan of Arc also came to Charles VII's aid during the Hundred Years' War to try to save France from being taken over by the English. She was a lot holier and more chaste than Agnes, but both women played very important roles in turning things around for France. Agnes was known for her kindness. Five letters that she wrote still survive, and, and in these, she talks about helping the poor and also helping injured animals, which is, I think, very ahead of her time to concern herself with injured animals. I love it. I love her for that. French chronicler Angejo de Monstrelet wrote of her, quote, so this Agnes was of a very charitable way of life and liberal in almsgiving, and of her possessions she distributed widely to the poor, to the churches, and to beggars. End quote. She also helped boost France's economy by promoting French fashion to market its luxury goods abroad. And I mean, to this day, France is kind of known for its luxury goods. So that's where the diamond wearing happens and how that catches on. She was also known to wear daringly low-cut gowns, which did not help her already scandalous reputation as the king's mistress. Trains up to 25 feet long, edged in fur, with those tall pointy fairy tale hats, which are called hennins, by the way, that were several feet tall. So she was not modestly dressed in the least. She had a loud, bold sense of style, and she was a trendsetter, for sure. But this did rub some folks the wrong way. One contemporary wrote, quote, She displayed in her costumes everything that could lead to ribaldry and dissolute thoughts. She was always desirous of this and stopped at nothing, for she uncovered her shoulders and bosom as far down as the middle of the breast. So, you know, she's kind of slutty, but she's nice and she's doing good things for France. I'll, I'll give her a pass on that. Artist Jean Fouquet painted her in 1452 as the Virgin Mary dressed in Mary's signature light blue and holding an infant. But 
One seemingly shocking detail of this portrait, her left breast is exposed. Which, I mean, I get it, she's holding a baby. Boobs are often out when a mother is holding a baby. But I have to imagine that this was quite risque for the time, and that people probably had a lot of opinions about this portrait. She looks pretty funny in the painting, but that's good. Because she's rocking the contemporary style of plucking your hairline back to make it look like you have a giant forehead. And also plucking out pretty much all of your eyebrows. That was in at the time. Don't ask me why. In February of 1450, Agnes went into early labor with her fourth child with the king and gave birth at only seven months pregnant. The baby died soon after. Then Agnes suffered from, quote, flux of the belly, which is diarrhea. She suffered this way for two or three days and then died of what people assumed to be dysentery. But there was always suspicion surrounding her death. If she had died of, quote, bloody flux, which is hemorrhaging of the uterus after childbirth and extremely common, though tragic, cause of death, it would have made more sense. But to randomly develop flux of the belly dysentery after childbirth didn't make as much sense. Rumors began to circulate that Agnes had been poisoned, but there was no way to prove it, and they just chalked it up to dysentery and moved on. So who would want to poison Agnes? Well, despite her positive effect on the king and the country in general, she certainly had some enemies. Enemy number one was Charles' son and heir, the future king Louis XI. According to Herman, Louis, quote, despised Agnes and blamed her for his falling out with the king and all the ills of the nation. Impatient to succeed his father, whom he saw as weak and wasteful, he criticized Charles' policy and excoriated the royal mistress, who had far more influence over the king than he did. One day in 1444, the prince ran into Agnes in the palace, cried, By our Lord's passion, this woman is the cause of all our misfortunes, and punched her in the face. End quote. So yeah, enemy number one for sure. After that, Charles exiled Louis, banishing him to southeastern France, where he tried to stir up a rebellion that was quickly put down. But he never stopped plotting against his father and Agnes and was noted as saying to his companions, quote, The king manages his affairs as badly as possible. I intend to put things in order. When I return, I shall drive away Agnes and shall put an end to all his follies and things will go much better than they are now. End quote. Soon after that, Agnes was dead and buried in the church of St. Ous in Loche. But then her body was exhumed in 1777 because church dudes were like, we can't have this slutty lady buried in our choir like this. So they dug her up from the prominent place that heartbroken Charles had buried her and they buried her in the nave of the church instead. I mean, kind of. There wasn't much left to bury. Her wooden coffin had rotted and the lead coffin had disintegrated. Her skull was in decent shape and it still had hair on it, although many of her teeth were missing, likely taken as souvenirs. Whatever remained of her bones was swept into an urn and placed under her black marble effigy. Her remains were probably disturbed again during the French Revolution around a decade later, which is when her jewelry was most likely taken. According to Herman, at this time, quote, The black marble funerary slab over her heart, which had been buried separately from her body, was taken by a butcher who proceeded to use it as a meat cutting table in his shop. Which, ew, weird and gross. We know all of this because Agnes' body was exhumed again in 2005, this time to finally get to the bottom of how she died. Eleanor Herman reports on this in depth in that Poisoning of Agnes Sorrell article, which, of course, I have linked in the description. Apparently, the research team found pieces of her skull in fairly good condition, including sections of her face, temples, sinuses, and upper jaw, although the back of the skull was missing. All of her teeth had been removed, and only seven of them were found in the urn where they dumped her remains back in the 1700s. But Herman reports they showed little sign of wear, no cavities, low tartar, and good enamel. 
thank you for that dental checkup. <laughs> I do think dental hygiene was rare for the time, but it's probably due to the fact that, you know, she was only 28 when she died. So just her teeth just hadn't rotted yet. The team also found a, quote, jumble of long bones along with bits of mummified muscles, chunks of mummified flesh with hair and eyebrows still attached, and, as the French scientists so poetically put it, putrefaction juice. Ew. To ensure that this was actually Agnes, they carbon dated the remains to the year of her death exactly, 1450. They also used computer imaging to superimpose the skull fragments they found on top of her face from her funeral effigy, which was sculpted based on her actual face, and they found that it aligned perfectly. According to Herman, quote, the shape of the chin, the placement of the teeth, the position of her ear canals, the opening of the nostrils, the size of the nasal cavity, and the distance and shape of her eyes all matched. What they didn't find was the plucking of eyebrows and hairline to the extent shown in her portraits. Artists had exaggerated that fashion, end quote. There was no evidence of disease except for roundworm eggs. So roundworms are a fairly common intestinal parasite that can live in people's digestive tracts. Agnes probably suffered from digestive problems due to this, but it seems like she was actively treating it at the time of her death. So they found the remains of some plant that was used to treat roundworms. It was typically taken with quicksilver, small amounts of quicksilver, which is mercury. Okay, next they tested some hair samples and found, quote, mind-boggling concentrations of mercury, 10,000 to 100,000 times the normal amount, many thousands of times more than she would have ingested as worm medication. Nor had the mercury been slathered on Agnes as part of the embalming process. The poison was inside her perfectly preserved root sheaths with no mercury at all on the outside. Researchers determined that Agnes ingested the mercury between 48 and 72 hours before her death, right around the time that she first became ill. Mercury poisoning was most certainly what killed her, end quote. They also found the bones, and infant loss trigger warning here, they also found the bones of an infant of seven months gestation in the urn, which... Uh, yeah, that checks out. We know she had just given birth to a premature baby before she died. They weren't able to determine if the mercury poisoning is what caused her to go into premature labor or not, though. So Agnes definitely died of mercury poisoning, which, according to the University of Florida Health, does cause massive blood and fluid loss from diarrhea and eventually kidney failure leading to death. But was she poisoned or was it roundworm medicine gone wrong? Herman seems convinced that Agnes was poisoned because the amounts of mercury in her hair roots were just so ridiculously high. There's no way someone accidentally gave her that much roundworm medicine. If she was poisoned, it was most likely by the king's son, Louis XI. Contemporary French chronicler Jacques Leclerc wrote in his memoirs, quote, and they said, too, that the said Dauphine had caused the death of a lady named Agnes, who was the fairest woman in the kingdom and greatly in love with the king, his father. End quote. But according to Herman, quote, Charles could hardly charge his dashing popular son and heir with her murder. Without Agnes by his side, the king slipped back into slothful melancholy, rousing himself long enough to arrange brilliant marriages to French aristocrats for his three daughters with Agnes. For a decade after her death, he engaged in wine-soaked orgies in between debilitating bouts of illness. Finally, an infection in his jaw, perhaps from a rotten tooth, caused an abscess to develop in his mouth. The growth swelled to such proportions that the king could no longer eat or drink. Charles VII starved to death in 1461. End quote. So, jeez, just, man, history is brutal. I have to admit, 
I had never heard of Agnes Sorel until I started researching the history of diamonds and stumbled upon her name. And her story just gripped me. I I feel for her deeply. The way people judged her, her tragic fate, and the way she was remembered, left breast exposed, France's first bimbo, breast and crotch. Like that's all there was to her. Never mind that she was described as extremely intelligent, kind, and caring, that her natural charm and charisma completely transformed the king and therefore the country for the better. I would love to read those five surviving letters she wrote. I couldn't find transcripts or anything of them anywhere. A Google search of Agnes Sorel letters just brought up a portrait of a heartbroken King Charles VII writing a farewell letter to her after her death. And so, like so many women, we're forced to view Agnes through the narrow lens provided by the men in her life. Men who loved her, men who hated her, men who profited off the good she did for France. Thank you all so very much for listening to this mini-fix episode of History Fix. I hope you found this story as interesting as I did. Don't forget to head on over to my Instagram, at History Fix Podcast, to see some images that go along with this episode. We'll see if Instagram allows an exposed breast. I don't know. And, of course, check back in on Sunday for your regularly scheduled, full-length History Fix episode. Information used in this episode was sourced from the Brooklyn Museum, Crime Reads, University of Florida Health, and Vice. And links to all of these sources can be found in the show notes.